Thank you and welcome to our webinar series devoted to a topic that our presenters as well as collaborative learning solutions are very passionate about, which is educator wellness. For today's webinar, What About Me? Creating a System of Community Care for Staff Mental and Emotional Wellness, we'll examine how to create a system of community wellness and acres for education staff to mitigate burnout. My name is Dawn and I will be your moderator today. I'll be behind the scenes supporting the presenters by moderating the chat and helping with the any tech issues that may arise. Now to share a little bit about our company. Collaborative Learning Solutions, CLS, is a K-12 educational consulting organization based out of Phoenix, Arizona. We have over 10 years of serving as a thought partner for schools, districts, and states, regional and county offices, helping to develop school climate guidelines and accountability systems that create safer, more supportive, and thriving learning environments. Now I'd like to introduce our two presenters for today, Otzi Sanchez and Jenna Cataletta. Both Otzi and Jenna are educational consultants at learning, a collaborative learning solutions for over three years. Jenna brings a wealth of experience as a former special education teacher, behavior interventionist, and district coordinator. Her passion for educator wellness inspired her to become a certified mindfulness and meditation teacher in 2020. Since then, Jenna has been an advocate for prioritizing teacher care through creating and facilitating educator wellness workshops. Otzi's experience has primarily been in mental health as a licensed marriage and family therapist with several years with several years experience providing mental health support on school campuses. She brings this background into her work with educators in supporting the needs of students as well as advocating for the needs of educators. Together, this dynamic duo are continuously inspired and motivated to be champions for educator mental and emotional wellness, speaking nationally on the imperative of the, this topic, along with facilitating teacher wellness workshops across the country. And now I get to take over. <laughs> thank you so much, Don, And thank you everybody for being here today. This is part two of our wellness series. Uh, so as we get started, first, we just want everybody to sit back in the comfortable position. You may be coming from a long day of working already. You may have a lot of things on your mind. And we just want you to feel as present as you can be as we spend this next hour together. So take a deep breath. Close your eyes if you want to. Um, ground yourself. Feel your feet. See where you're at right now. Just allow yourself to be present. Notice any distractions. And as we learned in part one, it's okay to have some thoughts coming in. We don't expect anybody to clear their minds. If you can, fantastic. Please practice that. But really, we just want you to feel like you're present here with us today. Feel free to be where your feet are. Take a couple more deep breaths. Okay, and when you're ready, feel free to open your eyes. You'll see on the screen, we have our community norms. That first one is be where your feet are. And that really is just the intentionality of being present, being in the here and now, um, and allowing yourself these next few minutes to really engage in what we have to share with you today. Be honest with yourself. Um, obviously, we're not going to be interrogating anybody in this, so we'll be giving you a lot of different information. Um, and feel free to lean in, knowing that some of the content is going to be, it might be challenging. We're going to be pushing a bit on what traditional education looks like. So uh, feel free to lean into that information, take care of whatever your personal needs may be. And just know that today's uh, presentation is going to be a bit more community focused. Part one of this training was much more self-care and looking inward and reflective. 
And we are doing some of that as well today, but really the focus is going to be on expanding outside of our own personal self-care and into the community care that will also support us as we support others. So just a, a note here, we did send out a, um, a note catcher or a handout. Don is going to put the link in there in the chat for you as well in case you missed that. Um, but the note catcher will also have a QR code on it with some resources. The resources are the same ones that we provided for part one of our series, but we do want you to be able to use these. And if you are an administrator or um, somebody in the space of leadership, we want you to be able to share these resources with your staff as well. Um, just another note as well, we have the chat open. We want you to be able to feel comfortable using the chat throughout. So you can use your handout for some more self-reflection, use the chat to communicate out with, with others. And we also have the Q&A function open as well in case you do have questions that you wanna ask us specifically. We probably won't get to the questions until the end, just given how much content we have to share with you today. But we do just want you to know that you have those, um, those available to you. Okay. So going back to that handout, first thing we want you to do is just take a moment to think about what your typical work week looks like. So today is Tuesday, I can't believe it already, it's already October, um, but just even thinking about this last week, what are some of the emotions that come up for you? So you can just take a moment and reflect on that using your handout or just a piece of paper. And when you have a moment with that, we're going to invite you to also add some of those words into the chat. You don't have to put all five, but even if there's a couple of emotions that are coming up for you, feel free to share those. All right, already we've got worried, we've got busy. Tired, absolutely. And stressed. our next stress, thank you. Um, our next prompt there is just uh, on average considering our stress level. Is it more low, medium, or high for you? And again, you could do the same. You can add some words into your handout. You can also add them into the chat. High, high stress, medium. Medium. Okay, thank you everybody. So as you can see here, there was a survey that was conducted. It was a pretty big survey, containing 5,000 educators. And the five emotions that came up the most were anxious, fearful, worried, overwhelmed, and sad. So you can see even some of the words in the chat are still reflecting some of this. And just noting here that obviously this survey took place in 2020 amidst the pandemic. So there was a lot already happening at that time. And yet here we are in 2024 and we're still seeing some of those same words. Uh, Jenna and I have done a number of wellness workshops and conferences and trainings in the past. And we typically get very similar words as well. So even though this was done in 2020, um, there have been several studies and surveys that have been done on a smaller scale, and there's still very similar results. So why wellness? Um, we're going to look at a few articles coming up here. Um, and so we just want you to take a moment and read through just these, these headlines here and think about what's standing out to you. We 
we can kind of see here, educator wellness isn't something that's new. There was problems with it going from before the pandemic. These articles are from between 2021 to 2024, so they are pretty recent, um, but it's speaking to a bigger issue, right? There's, um, there's, there's definitely something that's missing from education as far as really being able to support our staff. So just looking at these, just take a moment and kind of reflect, what are some noticings? Were there some words that you saw that kind of popped out at you? Um, were there specific things that were standing out? Is there some a person in particular, maybe a somebody that you work with that's kind of coming to mind as you read these? So just take a moment here and consider that. So when we think about some of the different articles that we saw, we hear the word burnout quite a bit. Something we also want to consider is considering how a teacher is feeling. How is that going to impact the way that they teach? How is that going to impact the learning of their students? We are very student first, student focused, which is what we want to be. And the feelings that educators are experiencing are going to impact that as well. Was there anything that you wanted to add here, Jenna? Well, we do have research to support that when teachers have positive correlated emotions and they show up to their classrooms with those positive correlation emotions, that students can directly feel them, they can name them, and they reap the benefits of those positive emotions. So when teachers feel uh, excited, connected to their passion, a sense of perceived happiness, we know that emotions are contagious. So well teachers equal well students. And it's just important to note that here. Let's say, okay, so we just want to give you a, a moment to just pause and reflect. And just think about what is coming up for you right now. That might be something you want to use your handout for. Jot down a few things. What's coming to mind? So as you're kind of thinking about what, what's coming up for you, we want you to consider too, when you hear the word self-care, what do you think of? And if you'd like to use the chat for this, you can do that as well. The word self-care will, will bring up different things for folks. So it's it's interesting to see sometimes what comes up for people. And then shifting into the words community care, what comes up for you with that? Community care is something that we hear about much less. So we do want to acknowledge that. We have a few participants getting in the chat with self-care, relaxation came up, and then with community care, the word support came up. Mm. And acknowledgement.
Thank you. And we have for self-care, focusing on the self-drinking water, making sure that you're eating lunch. Mm -hmm. and just those basic needs. It's interesting how the basic needs can go out of the window sometimes throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Yep. I talked to a teacher just today. He said that he rarely eats lunch and he's lucky if he gets to use the restroom at all during the day. Most days he will just wait until the end of the school day. So a lot of times he will intentionally not drink water or um, avoid eating too much just so that he won't have to use, so he'll be able to hold it, so he won't be able to use the restroom. And unfortunately, that's something that I've heard before. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, fo so for the focus on community care in the chat, we have community care is approachable and available. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's there's an acknowledgement here of just sometimes it's hard to even eat food, eat my breakfast, eat my lunch because of the level of anxiety of knowing what I'm about to embark when I go to work. Absolutely. All right, so here I just want to, I want to give you a little bit of a, a visualization, or not a visualization, but just something that I want you to just imagine, okay? So I want you to imagine that you're a teacher. Uh, we're going to call you Miss Robbins or Mr. Robbins. Um, but so just imagine that you are this teacher. You've worked at the same school for let's say about 10 years at this point. So you've been there for a while, you're comfortable at the site, you know where everything is, you know who most people are. Um, you've seen a few administrators kind of come and go at this point. Um, you have some colleagues that you kind of connect with briefly, kind of superficially, but you otherwise are feeling kind of disconnected from the school community. Um, and so there's been times that you've tried to advocate for yourself or maybe challenge a new initiative coming in or something like that. But um, because you've provided some of that advocacy, some of that challenge, you've been shut down or you feel like your ideas are being minimized. So as a result, you've tried to make efforts to connect with others, but you feel like you don't belong. Maybe you feel like Kind of the black sheep like you've been excluded a bit um and you tend to keep to yourself and just get in try to do your job right just stay in your lane so on the outside everything appears fine your students are showing progress and you rarely make any office referrals or try to make any waves uh, but on the inside you're really struggling to go to work every day and starting to feel burned out and maybe at times you've been question leaving the teaching career that you really were passionate and really loved when you first went into it. So just thinking about this scenario, what needs do you have in this situation? And you're welcome to share those or you're welcome to just reflect on it. But this is just your situation. What are some of your needs here? And now adding to this scenario, let's say you have a particularly hard day at school. Your admin walks by to find you alone and visibly upset. And in an effort to comfort you, they suggest you might need to take more time to take care of yourself. How does it make you feel to hear this statement? So knowing your situation, you're already feeling a bit disconnected. You're having a really hard day and somebody comes by to say, you need to take care of yourself. We have mildly offended, not good, frustrated. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
So when I th- when we hear Miss Robin's story, and Otzi does such a nice job kind of painting that picture for us, you may personally connect to that story. You may have a colleague or another teacher that you visualize that is Miss Robin's or Mr. Robin's. And we have a quote here for you, and you may be chuckling because initially this is kind of a funny statement, right? But it really goes along with Miss Robbins and her deeper needs that she had and feeling like her needs were really neglected or maybe neglected with the system that is supposed to care for her. Now, this actual quote was a real quote believe it or not, Otzi and I were doing a a self-care wellness workshop and we had a participant say this to us in a closing circle. And it was interesting because when we first heard the statement, we were kind of taken aback and thinking, why would someone be so triggered by simply saying it's important to take care of yourself, right? Well, we, we know that it's our job to take care of ourselves. And then we took some time and we self reflected and we said, you know, how could we get curious about what the deeper need is and why is self-care sometimes so triggering for individuals that that it can provoke a sense of anger at times. Now, when we think about this notion of self-care and when it comes to either self-care initiatives on campus or maybe other initiatives that we have in the school, We typically, how it goes is we roll out the initiative and say like it's self-care, a self-care initiative. And we have certain people that are getting, you know, get on the bus right away. And then we're going to have certain people that are slow to the initiative. They may struggle with the initiative. They uh, may outwardly express some reservations and some deep feelings regarding the initiative that they're struggling with. Like Miss Robbins, she tried to express some of those needs and she felt like she wasn't heard and she felt invalidated. And there's this typical notion that, okay, well in a community, a school community, if you have at least 70 to 80%, you know, keep moving with the initiative and the other 20% that are either gonna just, they're gonna get on board or, you know, maybe they'll, maybe they'll leave, right? And here we want you to ponder that notion and thinking about a community of care. Are those responses and those notions supporting a community of care? Really focusing on the 80% and neglecting the 20%. It's just something to think about. Of course, we need to keep moving forward with the uh, initiatives, but if we automatically disregard other people's needs and other people's maybe negative opinions, what does that communicate? And could that possibly be counter to what we're trying to build as a community, a community that cares about one another, a community that is supportive of one another and acknowledges one another. Those are the words that we saw in the chat. And oftentimes, we tend to value, whether we do this explicitly or implicitly, we tend to value compliance over our own, either our own needs, beliefs, and experiences, or over our communities member, our community members' needs, beliefs, and experiences. And maybe all that we are doing here and asking the participants is to keep people in your mind, uh, keep people in mind in your community that are already feeling on the fringes of the community. They're already feeling like they're an outsider. We wanna keep those people in mind because they are a part of your community and their needs, their beliefs, and their experiences are greatly valued and important and essential when it comes to building and sustaining a system of care or a community of care. So I'm going to read this quote to you because we're talking about moving from I to moving of uh, we, self-care to community care. And what this quote says is, if our care systems consistently award, encourage, and condition our educational caregivers to act in selflessness, how can a person without a self practice self-care? So just take a moment and self-reflect on thoughts and feelings that are coming up with that quote.
sometimes, again, usually unintentionally, when we're looking at systems, sometimes the educational system can glamorize selflessness, right? And typically, if we're talking about educational caregivers, teachers, staff, admin, we are typically hardwired to give and think of others. That's our like our superpower, right? But unfortunately, sometimes what happens when we are in a state of chronically being unbalanced, and we heard a little bit of that, just feeling so anxious we can't even eat our breakfast, sometimes we get in a mode where we are perpetually outwardly taking our energy and chronically thinking of of others. And what does that look like? Well, we may consistently work over our hours. We may have students in our room all of the time and not eat lunch, not get enough water throughout the day simply because we don't, we can't go to the bathroom, like Otzi said. And sometimes what happens in a system, we don't want that, of course, but unintentionally we may glamorize that level of selflessness. And when we glamorize that level of selflessness, maybe recognizing staff members that are going above and beyond, it can unintentionally perpetuate the feeling of, I am valued when I'm consistently putting others before myself, which is really counter to the message of self-care because we have these common sayings around self-care, right? We gotta put the gas mask on, before helping others, fill up your own cup before to make sure that you have enough to support others, whether that's your family, whether that's the students, whether that's the teachers that you serve. So we have these scenes, but sometimes the system does not support that to be so. So what would it look like if we just made some small little shifts and we acknowledged that that maybe we glamorize selflessness a little bit. And we started to acknowledge staff members that are trying to create strong boundaries at work, getting their lunch and prioritizing their lunch, maybe even taking a mental health day because they need it. What would that look like if we started to shift our focus just a bit Now, when we think about moving from the I to we and creating a community of care, it's important to note how Western society and other aspects of Eastern society uh, function when we think about community and the focus, right? So in Western society, very broadly speaking, we tend to focus on the I more. When we show up, we usually introduce ourselves, our first names, and we think about our own needs. And that's generally how it is, right? When we look at other uh, communities and societies, more Eastern communities and societies, there tends to be a focus more on the community and the wholeness of the community. There's even some communities that when they go to introduce themselves, they may in, uh, introduce themselves as their last name first, because that is more of a priority, the last name, because that's the part of the community and how they represent themselves. So there's just some differences to note there. Now, when we look at creating a community of care, we are going to glean on a story. This story was uh, told by an anthropologist a few years ago, and he went to a little town, a little, a little community in South Africa, and he did a scientific experiment. He brought a large basket of fruit, and he worked with the children in the community, and the, he brought the fruit, and he put the children on one side of the field outside and then put the basket of the fruit on the other side. And he told the children that when he says go, they can run towards the fruit and they can pick as many fruit as they want, okay? So you may think, hmm, I wonder if we were to do this in our schools or what would this look like with the students that we serve or even maybe our own children? Like, would they run like a madhouse? Would it be like a, a, you know, a, a Black Friday event at Walmart where they're grabbing the TVs and getting all the fruit that they want. Well, the anthropologist was actually shocked because what he saw once he said go was that all the children lined lined up, they held hands and they calmly walked around the fruit 
and then sat down in circle around the fruit and methodically pulled the fruit out one at a time to share the fruit amongst the community. And so once he, you know, caught his breath and said, wow, why? You had you had the ability to take all the fruit that you wanted, to bring it back to your own family. Why go about it the way that you did? And the children said a word, it's Ubuntu. And the word Ubuntu is largely defined and interpreted as I am because we are. Why take something just for me when I know that I get value from the health of the community? When the community receives, I receive. So we want to go back to Miss Robbins and we want to paint her story in a different way. If we could go back, you know, she's been in the education system for 10 years. What would it look like if we went back and we created more of a community of care for her? where she did feel acknowledged, she did feel supported, she just felt listened to, how would that change her perceptions, her daily emotions that she brings to the campus and that she shares with her students? So if we think about if we focus collective and community care, we know that each individual will feel more motivated to take care of self because they know when I take care of self, I know it's greatly going to benefit others. I can feel it directly because I am a valued member of my community and I'm vital for the health and wellness of the community. So now we're gonna be looking at, we looked at why wellness. We looked at a little bit of a mindset shift of moving from I to we. Now we're going to be giving you some time to think about how can we start to create a community of care? Or if you already have a creative, uh, a community of care or system of care, how can that be strengthened? So first we'd like to just define what does educator wellness look like? What does it mean when we say we want our educators to be well? And this is a quote from Dr. Bugrin, and it says, educator wellness as, uh, as a continuous active process towards achieving a positive state of good health and enhance physical, mental, emotional, and social well-being. And we're missing a word here. It should be is. So educator wellness is a continuous active process. So just take a moment and digest that that definition, that loose definition. And then what are some key words from that definition we can pull out when we're looking at creating a system of care for our staff and our families as well and students? Feel free to put it uh, in the chat if you're with us live or write it down on your note catcher. What are some of those key words that stand out to you? Now we typically hear some of those key words when it comes to, oh, they're flying in. We've got it, it's an active process. So in the chat we see, yes, it's active, it's continuous. So it's not just a once and a once and done thing. Oh, well, we meditated one, you know, we did a little breathing exercise three months ago during our staff meeting, so they should be good, right? It's continuous, it's active. Uh, it's about well-being. It's positive. Yes. And we can see different facets of what it means to be healthy, what it means to be well, physical, mental, emotional, and social. Those all take into fact uh, factors when it comes to our educate, educate, well, excuse me, educator wellness. So I invite you just to take a moment, and we are going to do some visualization. Now, when we do this visualization, you can do this with your eyes open or eyes closed. And we're going to start to embody what it would be, what it would feel like, 
what would be uh, the beliefs, the feelings, what you would be thinking, and what you would be experiencing when you walk onto your current campus, when it's focusing on community of care, okay? So I invite you to close your eyes, if you'd like, or gaze down. I want you to imagine that you just parked in the staff parking lot. And as you're getting out of your car, you see your school building. And instead of feeling anxious or worried, you actually feel excited, excited and even happy to step foot on a community that really values who you are and the gifts that you bring every day. You make your way to the door, you open the door with a sense of grounded assurance that you know, you know your needs will be met. And since your needs will be met, you feel confident in providing for your students or your staff. And as you are walking around campus, you're heading to your classroom or your office, you notice the faces that make up your community. And there's a sense of connection, of trust in one another, with one another, with a common vision and purpose. And if your eyes are closed, go ahead and slowly open your eyes and take a minute for yourself to just jot down any experiences or what you saw, what you felt. With that envisioning. Now that we have embodied the feelings, what we're thinking, what we're feeling, what maybe even what we're, we're believing about ourselves, our students, the campus, we're going to slowly start to shift towards action, the doing. What can we do to ensure that we are embodying that ideal vision of a, creating a community of care? So we invite you to pick one goal. And if you're already like, oh, stressed out, I don't know what to pick, that's okay, that's totally okay. If you have any ideas, write them down. We are gonna give you an example and walk through a um, our wellness pil pillars we call through an example. But we want to invite you to pick one goal, something that is practical, it's obtainable, and ideally something that you can create with staff. So again, a community of care is not something you are doing just for yourself. Nobody carries the weight of the community on their shoulders. No one does. So we, even if you have some ideas, we invite you to bring that back to a team that you work with, a tier one team, a climate and culture team. Hey, maybe you even have a wellness team. Bring that back to your staff. So now that we may have an idea of a goal, maybe not, that's okay. Hopefully by the end of this session, you will have something in mind to support your community with creating a system of care. We are going to be ut uh, utilizing our wellness pillars or the four A's. And those are awareness, acknowledgement or acknowledge, action, and accountability. And these four A's are applicable for self, whether I want to put more of an emphasis on caring for myself, as well as how to support the community. And we can see in this graphic, it's very cyclical. It's something that we are con uh, continuously moving through when we're thinking about how to greatly support ourselves actively, as well as our community. Okay, so at the beginning, we asked you to write five emotions that you commonly feel when you step on campus or throughout your school day. And we looked at then research of those five emotions. 
and they were anxious, worried, sad, frustrated. Sometimes we hear alone quite a bit. Well, we have a goal here just as an example. How could we start to shift a little bit and create a goal where teachers and staff, they come to work feeling more positive emotions, positive correlated emotions with their job and with the being a part of the school campus and the community. So then looking at our four A's, what would be that level of awareness? That's our goal. What should we do first? What would be that first step to take? So awareness is the ability to see things clearly and objectively. And the way we can do that is through reflection, through introspection. We can also make some conscious efforts to even gather some data in our community to, to get a better awareness of, well, how do teachers currently feel? We might know from research how other teachers feel, but how do teachers and staff feel uh, at our campus? And are the needs physical? Are they emotional? Are they mental, spiritual, social? That might help us prioritize a little bit what is most pressing for our staff. So what could we do to gain a greater awareness? Remember, that's the ability to see things clearly, to get those needs those beliefs for staff that may feel like those are being neglected, right? Well, we could send out some staff surveys. We could provide some listening circles to get some honest input of thoughts and feelings around the emotions that staff feel. Uh, we can gather qualitative, quantitative data. Oh, uh, we can ask more open-ended questions, right? So we can think about Miss Robin's experience and with the admin coming in, and instead of getting curious and asking her open-ended questions and listening, she just was told that she needed to do more self-care, right? So in order to gain uh, greater awareness of the needs, we can be open and curious, and we can ensure that we're not making assumptions based on other people's experiences and what they need to feel well on the school, uh, the school building. So once we have a good level of awareness to see things more clearly, the next A is acknowledge or acknowledgement. Now, acknowledgement means we're recognizing the, the fact, the importance or the quality of. In this case, it would be the importance, the fact and the quality of care that's needed for our staff. And we've gone through that awareness piece. We have a very good idea of the actual reality. Now, what do we do? Well, we may share that data with the community. We may have a level of transparency regarding the need where we're bringing out those feelings and those beliefs and those needs in a safe manner, of course. We want to avoid minimizing, using the word but, or making any excuses, which can be really hard because other people's perspectives, other people's beliefs may be really counter to our own, especially if you're an admin and you feel like, oh gosh, that feels like it's a direct attack on me and how I care for the staff. Just know the community of care is a we. So we approach that community of care with openness, and validating, even if we don't agree with what we're being, uh, what with what we hear. And we want to make sure that with the acknowledgement, it's a continuous effort. It's not just a one and done. We want to be consistent with our messaging. So I'm, I'm going to pause. We went through our awareness, our first A. We went through acknowledge or acknowledgement. I invite you to go back to your goal or what you think might potentially support your staff and your colleagues, and maybe take some notes about what would be helpful when it comes to awareness and acknowledgement.
Atsi, is there anything you wanted to say before we move on to our next A? No, I think you covered it pretty well. <laughs> All right, I'll pass it. I'll pass it to you then for our next A. Excellent. So our next A is action. You've already have that awareness of what some of those needs are, what what it looks like. You've acknowledged acknowledge that information. You've communicated it out to others. So there is, um, so there's more of that widespread awareness because you've acknowledged these are what are some of the needs or issues are. And now we're ready to take action. And when we say action, it's pretty clear what we mean. Um, but here within the context of this pillar, we're acknowledge we're highlighting it as an act, whether big or small, an act that is supporting wellness. We want to come back to those words of practical and consistent, right? We want it to be active. We want it to be continuous. What are things that we can we can do on a practical level? Um, it would be great to say we are going to put a Starbucks on every campus, and that's not practical. <laughs> that's not going to be manageable, right? What are some things that we can do? What are some things that are within our locus of control? What are some things that can be integrated into what we're already doing, right? Because if we are trying to say, okay, now we're all going to do this one new wonderful thing, a lot of times when we're introducing a new initiative, you get some of those groans and moans because people are sitting there going, okay, great. Now you're adding one more thing on top of my list of things that I already have to do. What we want to do when we are taking action is think about what's something that we can do really practically, something that's not going to take a lot more time maybe. Um, we have some examples here. For example, staff meetings. We already have staff meetings scheduled out. We already know they're gonna have to get done. What is something that we can do within a staff meeting that might bring out and help us to address some of those feelings that people might be experiencing? So um, even just today, at the beginning of our session, we asked you, what are some of the emotions that you're feeling, that you're experiencing, right? So what if we did that in staff meetings? And maybe it doesn't have to be as formal as we did it today. Maybe we just have, you know, we could do a big circle. Everybody's going to share one feelings word. Maybe we could do a fist of five, which is one of my favorites, because then you can just say, okay, who's checking in out of one today? Who's checking in out of five today? You know, getting some of that consensus. One, we're just getting people used to expressing some of that. We're making it a little more normal um, to really be able to express our, our emotions. And we're also able to get kind of a view of where everybody is at. If we are experiencing, um, for example, in, in the area where I live, we've had some fires recently. If I've got a whole community who's also being impacted by the fires, I might get more people that are going to be checking in at a one. And maybe that's a need I can address, right? Um, obviously, I can't do anything about the fires, but I can definitely take a few minutes just to check in with my colleagues, with other staff to see where they're at and how they're feeling. And even just that is an acknowledgement of where they're at. Um, so even that can be an action, just a small act that can make a big difference for somebody who might be feeling on the, on the outskirts of things. Um, as Jenna mentioned earlier, we can honor and celebrate wellness, right? Okay, well, so-and-so hasn't taken a vacation. They are going to finally take a vacation. That's wonderful. Yes, let's encourage some of that because we also know when that person goes off and takes vacation, they're going to come back feeling more rested, more ready. They're going to be they're feeling a lot more present and really wanting to be there. So we want to be able to highlight some of those things. We want to model the strategies, right? If I'm promoting healthy eating for my staff, my staff and I'm coming in eating a donut every day, it's probably not the best modeling. Um, and I can also model um, transparency and saying, you know what? I really messed up there. Maybe I can do better next time. I am definitely going to try, right? Because I'm, all, I'm not perfect. Nobody else is perfect. And we don't want to show others or show staff, especially 
that we have that expectation that they're never going to make a mistake. If anything, we want to demonstrate some accountability. Um, oh, and before I move on to accountability, actually, I did want to um, ask Jenna about that investing in a water system because going again back to those basic needs, right? If I am going to be providing, let's say I have donuts for my staff every Friday, and yes, that is nice and wonderful, but I also have staff that are not allowed to use the restroom all day. The bigger mm -hmm. issue might be around using the restroom rather than get some donuts, right? So when we think about our action, we also want to think about where are where are the bigger needs. Absolutely. I th and that's why the first A is always awareness. Mm -hmm. Because as you are cultivating greater awareness, you may be surprised what the greater needs are. And with one of the schools that I worked in, our awareness, when we became aware that the greatest need for wellness was that staff weren't eating and drinking throughout the day. And it really connects to what Otzi was saying and, and that that story of a, a teacher now that is experiencing that. And so that was... we we focused on that. And it seems like such a small thing. Like we're going to make, ensure that our staff have access to water and food. And this was the interesting thing because oftentimes we're so students first. We're like, Oh, anytime, you know, if a kid is hungry, there's snacks, we got them. And we said, what if we also did that for our staff and we just provided some healthy snacks. So if they forgot to pack their lunch or if they they didn't get to eat their lunch or they don't have time to eat their lunch, what can they go down to the office and just get the, uh, get a small healthy snack or ensure that they can fill up their water anytime they need to. And that, that small gesture of doing that actually really impacted everyone on a physical wellness level. And we know when people are feeling physically well, that impacts our social wellness, our emotional wellness and our mental wellness as well. And now we get to our final and fourth pillar, which is accountability, uh, which I talked about a little bit during uh, during the action pillar. But essentially, a accountability is the acceptance and declaration of responsibility. I'm going to take ownership of what I'm doing, both for my own wellness and also to I'm also accountable to my community. So what does some of that communication and commitment look like? If I say, you know, we're going to have, for example, Wellness Wednesdays, <laughs> I don't know exactly what that would look like. But if we're going to do that, does it end up just being one Wednesday a month? Um, is it is it something that's working? Is Are the staff truly feeling like they're using more positive words and positive emotions related to what I'm trying to implement, right? Um, we want to make sure that we're going back and evaluating that what we are using is in fact, one, it's beneficial, and also that we are staying true to it, that it is something that is active, that is continuous, right? Going back to all of that. Is it a one and done? Is it something that we're truly being true to and really encouraging throughout? So how do we do that? How do we incorporate more of that accountability? Sometimes it's helpful to have partners or buddies, right? I'm going to have a, an exercise goal and Jenna's gonna be my accountability partner. So that days that I don't go, not she's, not going to, <laughs> she's not gonna criticize me, right? She's going to encourage me. She might ask me what the barriers have been, right? Um, she might support me through some of those barriers and give me some other ideas. So accountability partners, especially when you have a team like your tier one team, like your climate and culture team, those are great ways to ensure that what you're doing truly is working, it truly is effective, and we are going to keep it going. Oh, and one more thing here. Um, just going back to what Jenna said earlier around really focusing on our 80% that are bought in versus our 20%, our naysayers, the folks that are pushing back and giving some challenge. Those are typically the folks that might need the additional support, right? When we think about um, even the example of, of Mrs. Robbins or Mr. Robbins, 
um, that person needed a little bit more support. When we think about our students that need more support, we think about our tiered system, right? That, that particular student is gonna need an additional layer of support because what we have at tier one is not working for them as well. And we can think about some of our staff that way as well, right? We have to our standard tier one things we're gonna provide to everybody. And Mrs. Robbins might be somebody who has some tier two needs or some tier three needs. Maybe I need to do some individual check-in. Maybe I need to provide or offer some um, like a small community of support within the grade level or maybe an accountability buddy, a way to offer some additional support that might be lacking there in order for them to feel more included. So I know we are getting close to the end of our time here. We do have a quote here. One of the marvelous things about community is that it enables us to welcome and help people in a way we couldn't as individuals. When we pool our strength and share the work and responsibility, we can welcome many people, even those in deep distress and perhaps help them find self-confidence and inner healing. And lastly, we come to our closing connection where we are going to just ask you to take a moment and just think about everything that we discussed today. Think about some of the things that were coming up for you as we were talking about different things. You might have felt yourself relating really closely to Miss Robbins and to that scenario, maybe to some of the articles. Um, maybe somebody in particular came to mind, somebody, a colleague who, um, who you feel might be on the outskirts or somebody who tends to be kind of a naysayer. Um, and hopefully you're thinking about what that person's needs might be as they are reacting in the way that they do. So um, just take a moment, give your brain some time to just process through. And when you've had that moment, Please just add to the chat what has been your takeaway from today. And while we are processing, I'm just going to put a little bit of music on for us to give us that time. Like we have a couple folks responding in the chat. And uh, so we encourage everybody to take a moment, think about it. Um, if you want to read what others are saying, please feel free to. Um, but in the meantime, we just wanted to honor your time. And thank you for being with us today. If you are watching the recording, thank you for watching <laughs> and for being here as well. Um, we do, if you have another moment, you are more than welcome to stay on. We will stay on in order to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and if you do have a moment, please give us your feedback. We have a QR code up. Um, you're more than welcome to just scan that and answer a few questions. This is a, this is definitely a big passion point for Jenna and myself. So any feedback you have is really appreciated. We want to continue to improve this presentation, as well as other workshops and things that we provide. So um, again, feel free to stay on longer and uh, we wish you a great evening, great afternoon. Um, and uh, 
Hope you have a great day. Anything else, Jenna? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for taking time for yourself, for your community. And thank you for taking just a moment to provide us feedback. As Otzi said, we're very passionate about the work that we do to support educators with their own wellness. So any feedback that would improve our practices would be greatly appreciated. Can we get the music back, Jenny? <laughs> sure thing.